I'm Sharon Spurlock. I'm the Senior Director of Family Education at the St. Louis ARC. I've been here about 34 years and um, really enjoy being able to talk to families about all kinds of things, but supported decision-making is uh, near and dear to my heart. I think it's really an, an important topic. I want to uh, introduce Deborah Fiasco from Special School District. Deborah, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about you? Okay, thanks, Sharon. Hi, I'm Deborah Fiasco, and I work for Special School District. I'm in the Family and Community Engagement uh, Department. I've been with the district for nine years, and before that, I spent about 20 years with the state of Missouri with the Department of Mental Health. I'm also a family member, and this uh, topic, much like Sharon, is really near and dear to my heart about how we can support our uh, children in supported decision making and look at some of these alternatives to guardianship or use it even when guardianship is the right choice for a family. So I'm really thrilled to be here tonight and be included in this presentation. Thank you. Uh, and I think Deborah said something really important. So I want to just kind of back into the history of, of our ability to present this. We've been teaching some version of this workshop for several years now. Uh, almost 200 families and individuals with disabilities, I think, have sat through and, and talked through conversations about supported decision making. And this really came up when um, there was legislation out there to change our guardianship law. Our guardianship law was very old in the state of Missouri. It was very narrowly defined. There was not really a lot of options about how people uh, could be evaluated for their decision-making skills, what your options were for decision-making other than guardianship. And in fact, as you'll see in our presentation a little bit later, it gave us a very high number of people who ended up under guardianship. And so uh, after the law was passed, it took a couple of legislative cycles. A consortium was formed across the state to talk about how to get out the information to all the all the necessary people, to families, to public administrators, to lawyers and judges, to educators, so that we would be able to help people understand what their options were. So as you go through this presentation tonight, we're not suggesting that the only option for you is supported decision making. However, we believe that everyone can be involved in supported decision making, even if you choose additional forms of decision making for your family members. So it's important for me to say, as we start that even if you have full guardianship for your family member, these decision-making strategies are something that you can use to help them make the most decisions that they can for themselves. Deborah, is there anything what you want to add? While well, I'm and I'll here? add that and doing it as early and as often, it's never too late, but as early as we can start with this, it's wonderful. Um, and that Neither Sharon or I are attorneys, um, so we're not giving any legal advice tonight, but we um, will point you just in some directions of some of the legal um, components that you could utilize instead of guardianship. Okay, well, we've already told you about us, so um, and we really already told you our goal. We really want to empower individuals with developmental disabilities or people with special health care needs and their families and key supporters to make informed decisions as they look at their options and alternatives for getting the right amount of support. So we feel like you hear a lot about guardianship, maybe sometimes not as much about supported decision-making, representative payee, power of attorney. So our goal tonight is for you to have all the information. I really like to start with this quote because, uh, you know, I think everybody makes choices, even when you choose not to choose. So here's a Sartre quote. I am my choices. I cannot not choose. If I do not choose, that is still a choice. If faced with inevitable circumstances, we will choose how we are in those circumstances. So one of our pre-submitted que uh, questions was, how can I uh, work with my family member who can't make decisions for themselves? And I think it's really important that we start with the understanding that everybody makes decisions for themselves, whether it's what they uh, eat for breakfast or whether they choose to uh, do what they're supposed to do during the day or sit down on the floor and say, nope, I'm choosing not to do that today. Um, all of those things are choices. Whether I choose to stay in bed and not engage would be a choice. So um, I think everybody makes choices, whether they're good choices or not um, remains to be seen. 
So what we hear a lot when we talk to families about decision making is that everybody starts from a place of safety and health. And I think that makes total sense. You want your family member to be cared for. You want them to be safe. And a lot of times I think families think that getting guardianship is going to somehow provide that safety net for their family member. But the reality is, is that's not necessarily the case. Having guardianship doesn't wave a magic wand where your family member can't get into a situation where they are unsafe or they're in trouble. Um, Deborah, would you jump in and tell your story about the young lady who was uh, working at the grocery store? Yeah. Um, and she, her parents had guardianship and her mom came to pick her up. She was working at a local grocery store and she was on some medication where it was really contraindicated for her to have alcohol. Um, but she bought some when she got off her shift and, and she was drinking it when mom showed up and mom was like, I've done everything to protect her. I got guardianship. And I said, no one asks for that at the liquor store. No one asks for that at the Sprint store. If she's going to buy a phone for some person who talked her into it, the piece of paper that the judge hand, hands down in guardianship does not do as good a job many a times of protecting our children as having those conversations and, and having that conversation with her daughter saying, you know, you're on this medicine and you are over 21, you have an ID, but, but you really shouldn't drink. It's really bad for your health right now. And this is why would have done a better job of protecting her daughter, but she thought that the guardianship process was how she was protecting her daughter. And then later understood it's about those meaningful conversations. And that really falls into that second point as well. It's the same situation with being taken advantage of, unless you're going to stand with your family member every minute of every day, they need to have some understanding about how to recognize when somebody's taking advantage of them or recognizing when there's a situation where they're unsafe um, to the best of their ability. Some people may not be able to be left alone for any length of time, um, small lengths of time, others for very significant amounts of time, but but protection is gonna be about more than that. A lot of times people um, want to step in and get guardianship because they've reached the age of majority. My family member's an adult now and they are somebody that needs support. So I naturally need to step into a guardianship role. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Or you're getting told by somebody else, a school administrator, a teacher, a doctor, that it's time and you need to get guardianship and those people are trusted and valued allies. Um, so those are things that naturally come up that maybe make you think, should I get guardianship? And there may be even somebody who's pressuring you to say, you need to get guardianship so your family member is protected, so that you're the one that's included in decision making. And I think a lot of times it's just seen as that next step when a child turns 18 and becomes an adult, that that's the next step that we take. Um, and But remember, your, your physician and your teacher are probably not attorneys either, and, and legal advice should come from an attorney. Absolutely. So let's talk about the law. This is our new law, really not that new anymore. It's almost five years old. Um, court must consider whether the respondent's needs may be met without the necessity of the appointment of a guardian or conservator or both by a less restrictive alternative. So our law specifically identifies several different ways that you can protect somebody and provide supports and decision making without going through guardianship. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but maybe that their finances are being managed in a trust by a trustee or that there's a representative payee, but right there in the middle, supported decision-making agreements or the provision of protective or supportive services or arrangements provided by individuals or public or private services or agencies. That's a mouthful, but really what that means is that legally you can put together a plan that says, I'm gonna rely on person A, B, and C to help me make decisions, and that can be a legally binding agreement. So in our state, um, guardianship has increased 50% since the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, which I find really fascinating because that law was designed 
to ensure the rights of people with disabilities. But unfortunately, I think it made a lot of people concerned that people would be taken advantage of. And so guardianship has increased. Right now in our state, 51% of adults have full or limited guardianship across the country. But in Missouri, it's over 80%. In other states, less than 20 or 22 percent. Um, so what's the difference? Is our population that different or is it about how we educate people, how we communicate about it? So um, Deborah, why don't you talk about these rights under guardianship and what can be removed? I think that's the big piece here is that guardianship is, is really one of the most, it's probably more restricted than incarceration. Yeah. And we, and we do hear that, 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 uh, uh, a convicted felon has more rights sometimes than someone who is under legal guardianship. So losing the right to marry and to vote and to make all of those um, adult decisions, most of the time, uh, Sharon and I will talk to families and they'll say, but there's some rights I would like for my child to retain. Um, they are going to have the capacity to drive. I'd like to see them drive and they can retain um, without full guardianship and they can vote. Many of our, we encourage that advocacy piece and citizenship with all of our students and all of our um, all the individuals. So we want them to keep those rights. Um, but full guardianship removes all of those civil rights and really does um, put the court in the position of power over a person um, rather than the person themselves about making those decisions. I think our next slide is one that um, it, here at special school district, we hear a lot that teachers are saying, again, that next step is just to protect your child and to get guardianship. And if you want to continue to be the educational decision maker, you will need to get guardianship. Um, but, but what we know is true that while your child will become 18, they will become an adult, they will become the educational decision maker and that transfer of rights will go to them. You are still under the Eternal Revenue Code eligible and um, to receive all of the copies and notices that are given to your child to attend those meetings and access to your child's educational records. We'll also share with you a little bit later on a supported decision making agreement that specifically covers educational rights um, or they could be covered under a power of attorney. But the, the um, reality is you already have the rights under the Internal Revenue Service to continue to receive information about your, your, your child, your student. I think the real important thing is, is when we start talking about those educational decision making um, opportunities is again to start as early as we possibly can so your child is um, used to having support in making those good decisions. And hopefully that supported you. So a part of this for us is this balance, balancing protection and assistance with autonomy and self-determination. So there's a lot of research that shows that the more people have control over their own lives and have the ability to make decisions, the more they're going to feel happy, the more respected they're going to feel, the more goals they're going to pursue and be successful with, because that gives you that sense of achievement, that sense of full um, uh, control over your life. But we also want to make sure that there's systems in place in the community with money, with relationships and healthy nutrition. So this is just another way of looking at what Deborah was talking about and thinking about each of these areas. In what parts of these areas can your family member make decisions? Where do they need some support? And where do they need you to step in, if at all, to make decisions for them? So that's the definition of autonomy. It means self-directing your freedom to consent, refuse to consent, withdraw consent, or otherwise control or exercise choice or control over what happens to him or her. 
And I think it's a natural progression when we have young children, they don't really have very many choices at all about what happens to him or her in a, in a given day, that parents are in total control, but as, as a child gets over, they have more freedoms, maybe to go to a friend's house and spend some time away from home, to spend time alone pursuing a hobby, uh, or to make choices about the clothes they wear or what they're going to eat when they go out to a restaurant. So those things start to build and, and create that sense of autonomy, even for very young children. I know I share stories about my grandchildren now. I shared stories about my children, now my grandchildren. And my two-year-old, I give him, two-year-old grandson, I give him choices all the time. Now they're choices that I can live with. And it might be the choice of every single time you want to drink out of the blue cup or the green cup. And he's learned that he gets to make decisions. And sometimes they're not decisions that he is okay with until he gets that freedom to choose. So things like who's going to give you a bath. Um, I don't want a bath. Okay, you can choose between grandma and grandpa. I choose grandpa. And that self-determination of the freedom to choose is really helping him learn how to do some of these things. Now, we continue to give him support, like this says, and the responsibility, well, two-year-old responsibility for taking a bath is, but but you see what where we're going with this is that self-determination builds these skills and we want to build them from wherever our, our children are or our loved ones are to really empower them to focus on what they want and how to get there. Because self-determination also as an adult is how we get up and go to work in the morning, how we do choose to live a healthy lifestyle, how we do make better and better decisions. And then um, to be respectful of all the in individuals by giving them that, that chance to have self-determination and all of these freedoms. And I want to circle back to something we said at the very beginning. These are all things that can happen at any time in your life under any level of decision-making support. So if I work with people every day that have guardians, but they still make choices and I can support them to have as many of those choices as possible. For example, in people that live in our residential homes, are able to choose what they wear during the day. And if they're making a bad choice based on weather or something else, then our job is to talk to them about, hey, I looked at the weather this morning and it's gotten quite a bit colder today. Would you like to maybe look at this long sleeve shirt today instead of the short sleeve shirt that you're wearing? You know, to be able to let people make choices about picking out foods at the grocery store that they're going to eat for dinner. Um, I think all those things give you a better quality of life. And those are all people, largely people have guardianship, as we said, 80% in the, in the state of Missouri. But even within that guardianship model, there are many, many choices you can make during the day. So supportive decision-making, we, we're finally going to get to that. I know you guys are just waiting with bated breath. Uh, the formal definition is that supported decision-making, alternatives to guardianship included supported decision-making, should always be identified and considered whenever possible prior to the commencement of guardianship proceedings. So I want to point out to you that that is the statement made by the National Guardianship Association. So this is my last pitch about this, is that even people that recognize how important guardianship is in certain circumstances only want that to be a last alternative. So that's the best opportunity to look forward here is to go through this. And I'm going to skip these videos um, and talk a little bit about decision making with this person here. Everyone has the right to make decisions. You can make decisions on your own or you can get support to make decisions. Support can come from people like friends, family, or support workers. Support can also come from things like having easy read information or just having time and space to think. Supported decision-making is about putting you at the center of your decisions. There are things I want people to know, 
when I am making decisions, I can change my mind. We can all change our minds at any time. I may say I want to go to the movies, but then decide I want to stay home and watch TV instead. I can try. I do things on my own or with support. I can try something new like rock climbing and I might not do well at first. But I can try and it does not have to be perfect. I can make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. It is okay and that is how we learn. Listen to me. My voice is important and I deserve to be heard. I have a voice too. Give me the information I need. It is important I have the right supports to help me understand information. I might need information in Easy Read and someone to read it with me. It is my life. I can choose what I do in all areas of my life. It can be anything from what I eat in the morning to what I do on a Saturday night. Give me the support I need. Sometimes I need a supporter to understand my needs and help me make decisions. Like choosing where to live or what job to get. I can decide. I have the right to decide, like choosing to get married, having children, or getting a pet. Everyone has the right to make decisions. You can find all these ideas in our document called Making My Own Decisions. You can find it on our website here. So I went to Australia to get that little video, but I think it's really nicely laid out. And I think it's nicely laid out for a person with a disability and for a family member. That's a kind of an easy read, easy to understand example. Um, in a nutshell, supported decision-making is the kind of decision-making that every person makes on a day-to-day -day basis. For desire, some decisions that when you get up in the morning, you know what it is you want to eat for breakfast, you might know what it is you want to put on to wear to work. You get to decide what, whether to listen to music or news or have quiet on the way to work. And then there's decisions that you have that you might want assistance with. I bought a car not too long ago and I'm not, don't know anything about cars. So I used all kinds of resources to help me. Some of them were things like Google research and CarMax and, and reading up on, um, you know, reviews of different cars, what the different features of the different cars were that I might need. And then I talked to people that were car people. Tell me what you think. Um, here's the things that I think are important to me. What do you know about this kind of car? Where would you direct me? And then I even went and saw cars and looked at cars out on the lot. So I may ultimately decided what car to get, but I needed a whole lot of help to do that. I recently went to the doctor with somebody because he was having an appointment with the doctor that he'd never seen before. He was the one that had talked to the doctor directly, talked to him about all of his health concerns, gave the doctor feedback about what was going on, but he asked me to be there with him so that when the doctor gave him options about what kind of, of treatment that he could get, I could help him make decisions about what to pursue. And there were things that he did want to pursue um, like getting blood work and getting his first colonoscopy. And there were things that he said, no, I don't, that's not a priority for my right now. I'm going to wait on that. Um, so would I have made the same decision? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I felt like he made a good decision for him. So I mentioned research before. People that have make more decisions for themselves healthier, they're more independent, they're better adjusted and better able to recognize and resist abuse. I think that's so important to know. 
Uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who do not have a guardian are more likely to have a paid job, live independently, have friends other than their staff or a family member, go on dates and socialize and practice the religion of their choice. And I probably can update this. The national core indicators have been updated since then. So I will be surprised if the statistics are much different. So let's talk about where to start. Deborah, you want to jump in? So this is a tool that I use all the time in looking at how uh, to make decisions and what to look at in that in those supported decision making. And we're using this It's a charting the life course tool out of UMKC. Um, and it's all about supporting your loved one in the daily life um, area. So we've got daily life and employment, we've got healthy living, um, their social and spirituality, safety and security, community living, and then advocacy and engagement. And the whole point of this tool is to look at these questions and areas. And so under healthy living, um, do I understand the consequences if I refuse medical treatment, much like Sharon was talking about? And maybe your loved one really needs a lot of support in that. Uh, maybe it would be a YouTube video and a conversation about it and maybe talking to someone else in the family that they trust. They might need a lot of support. Um, but the whole point is we all need support in doing most of these things. And it's about moving from, I need someone to make those decisions for me to realizing this is a learning and a teaching moment. And that's part of what Trying Life Course Tools, we're gonna to show you a couple more. This is the integrated support star is really about having those meaningful conversations. Much like the mom who had had, a, who, if she'd had a conversation about her daughter's medication rather than putting her on the medication, which she needed, but having these conversations and moving to the point where I can make more of my own medical decisions, or I know where to go for support in making my medical decisions or my employment decisions or some of these other areas. So we don't all start off making all of our decisions and we don't end up making all of our own decisions independently, but we do move across that to know how to make these decisions. So this tool walks through each area of life. And I think Deborah said this, but I want to go and just make sure you see at the top here, there are, uh, you'll see a blue person, a purple box with people in it, and then a green box with a courthouse in it. And so this is divided into decisions that the person can make all by themselves decisions that they need or want support with, and then decisions where a legally binding something needs to be in place. So as we look at that in the next page, thinking about, do I choose when to go to the doctor or dentist? If your family member gets a notice in the mail saying they need to go to the doctor or dentist, do they are they able to work with you to choose a date? Are they able to, to contact the doctor's office and make an appointment? Do you need to provide some support? A lot of the people we work with, they probably need some support. Do they need you to do it for them? I don't know. Um, depending upon the kind of supports that might be available for somebody, they may need you to do it for them, or they may just need you to dial the telephone for them. Or maybe they need you to have a script and role play with them a few times to practice before they try to make an appointment. That can be a difficult skill to work on, but depending upon your family members' communication skills, um, other, other um comfort levels they have with using the phone, that's a really great skill to build for themselves. Um, do they know uh, what the consequences of their medical treatment? Deborah talked about that just a minute ago. Do they know how to get help if they have a serious medical problem? Who are the, who are the people that I need to reach out to? And how do I reach out to them? How do I tell people? So all these things are things that are open for conversation. And I think conversation is such a great starting place. And if the person isn't using words to communicate, hopefully there's another communication system that you can engage them with. But um, at the very least, you can um, 
try things, you know, try giving them some information that they can share directly with the doctor that you prepare in advance with them. Try some of these strategies and see if they're able to take the lead. Um, we, Deborah was mentioning, this is the support star, which is a charting the life course tool. And this particular support star is a, we call them the cheat sheet stars. It's the pre-filled out star that describes different alternatives to guardianship. And I really do want to walk through some of the specifics on here, because I think how is always the question families come to the table with. How can I help my family member to build their decision making skills? How can I support them if they're not good with money and, and they're losing access to it? How can I protect them and make sure that they're safe? So, Deborah, how about we go around the different sections of this? I'll start with personal strengths and then I'll let you pick the one that you want to go to next. Okay. Um, so the first place we start with decision making is what does the person have capacity for? So communication is key. So uh, no matter your age, the more we can build your communication skills, the better we are. And technology makes our options better and better every day for this. So figuring out ways to help people communicate uh, if they have words to communicate what they're feeling, what they're thinking, to communicate about what they want. Um, if they don't, well, can they use gestures? Can they use a communication device? I've worked with people to use icons and um, physical objects to help them communicate. Um, we had one woman who learned to tell us what she wanted to do during the day by going to her closet and picking a set of shoes. And the, and the tennis shoes meant go to the park. And another set of shoes meant that she wanted to go to the library and and it was really interesting to me to see how the staff worked out with her a way for her to communicate about how she could choose what to do during the day um, understanding money how far can you help that person learn about money management and the concept of money do they have some personal safety skills do they know their own address and phone number do they carry an id um, do they know what to do in an emergency and are they prepared an emergency with any kind of information about their medications or access to safety kinds of items. So Sharon touched on the technology a little bit on uh, knowing how to communicate, but technology has really helped us in this realm a great deal with safety and security. Back in the day, we always had, it was about having a one-on-one -on -one with many of our um, individuals, but now we've got all kinds of smart home things. We have watches, we have phones, we have GPS systems, we have computers that we can look up different resources. We have all kinds of adaptive telephones and other equipment. And it doesn't all have to be high tech. Sometimes we're looking at um, a visual schedule about how to stay safe or um, a buzzer or a bell or something like that. So it doesn't all have to be expensive and high tech, but looking at what kinds of technology, high tech and low tech, that could help them say, stay safe to learn about safety or to improve their daily life through um, some of these things. It also looks at money management with it, which I think is a really big thing that families worry about. Um, it, this kind of goes over the the big couple of um, concerns for families in about money management. I don't want my loved one to be taken advantage of. So do we have checking accounts? where we do online banking and you can keep track of what's going on. Are there debit cards that you can limit the amount of money that can be spent on a debit card or how big a purchase can be or how many transactions during the day? So there's lots of different technology things that can help in all of the areas of safety and security that guardianship or if you have guardianship, still using these things to give them the option for as much um, self-determination and independence and autonomy as, as is possible. I'm going to go down to the bottom uh, left quadrant, which is our community-based resources. And these are people that anybody in the community could go out and tap into and start conversations about support for safety and security. So 
one of the things that I learned early on is that the more people that your family member knows and that know them in the community, the less likely they are to be taken advantage of because people are paying attention and people are going to be watching out. So who um, knows them? Do they have a doctor or a nurse who can help advise them? Can the doctor or the nurse practitioner or somebody in the office simplify the information that's being shared and make it more understandable? to them? Can they talk about why they take certain medications or why a certain treatment is important? And I think all of us value being able to hear that from a medical professional and maybe take more heed if somebody tells us all the information we need to know. A clergy member or a life coach, somebody that you trust to share your um, problem solving with, things that are, are weighing on your mind, things that you're trying to decide and getting feedback from somebody. Financial advisors, everybody uh, that wants to build their own financial wealth takes advantage of opportunities to talk to financial advisors about how can I save money? How can I protect my decisions? Um, and we have some great resources now, which we'll talk about under eligibility for managing and saving money for people. Um, as Deborah mentioned, you can have a limited bank account, especially as you're building skills. And I hope that you've noticed that we're talking a lot about stepping stones, that you're not, we're not saying just release your family member to the wild and let them make independent decisions and, and suffer the consequences of those and learn from them. These are all stepping stones along the way. So could you set up a bank account that's a joint account and somebody can't spend more than a X number of dollars? without double signatures? Can you get a, a cap debit card that just shuts off after $50 or $25? And, and if they try to spend more than that, they can't. And then they kind of start to build their understanding of the value of money. Is there a direct deposit for your paychecks? An automatic bill pay. Automatic bill pay. My goodness, do I rely on that. If I didn't have something automatically paying my bills every month, I would be in and is there still a debtor's jail? Probably not, but I would be in big trouble because that's not something that I am good at about keeping track of. So I rely on that. Personal safety, our neighbors. You know, if you have not gotten to know your neighbors, those are people that are there. Uh, I found during COVID, it was wonderful to find out how many of the neighbors knew me, recognized me. We talked about what was going on in the neighborhood. Um, you know, I, my next door neighbors have keys. They, they know kind of my comings and goings. And if somebody that's not supposed to be here is here, they'll ask me about it. We have each other's phone numbers. You'll, you'll find that there's going to be a neighbor who might be willing to help out. The police, the fire department, emergency medical responders, all of those people are people that we can tap into and making sure that our family members have connections to them. Okay, Deborah, are you going to go relationship or eligibility? I'm always going to go relationship because <laughs> eligibility should always come last. So all of the things that having relationships in your life. So Sharon's already mentioned friends and neighbors and, and how those people can support. But in supported decision-making or decision-making supports, using those power of attorneys, having someone who serves as a power of attorney or is one of your supported decision-making um, uh, people that you've chosen, they've chosen that you're going to be the person who helps me with my money management, helps me with my health care decisions. So all of those people that are important in their life, and that would include all of us who are helping our loved ones either with guardianship or alternatives to guardianship. Again, money management. You can see where all of these kind of um, rely on each other. And that's the beauty of the integrated support star. We want to make sure that we look at all of these different areas but they rely on each other so much, just like in life. So having these kind of um, things that are more, uh, what's the word, uh, formal, um, but they're relationship-based. So I can't have a durable power of attorney with myself. I need to have a relationship with someone who I've chosen to be my attorney, in fact, to help me with some of these things. 
Excellent. All right. Well, I will round us out with eligibility. So the eligibility box is where you've got eligibility based on some attribute you have. In this case, we're talking about disability, but when you're using the STAR, just so you know, this might be your own eligibility as an employee, a veteran, um, a member of an organization. So um, that's how we think about this area. So in the area of safety and security and decision making, you may have a service coordinator that could be helpful and help you understand some of the decisions that are available to you, what your choices are. You could pursue a limited guardianship. And we haven't really talked about that, but limited guardianship would be where you carve out things like um, keeping the right to vote, keeping the right to drive, keeping the right to marry, so that that's not um, something that's restricted by the guardianship rule. Money management, a real simple thing that a lot of people actually prefer to have happen is to have a representative payee, having somebody that gets the, the check every month from the government that helps to pay for some of the bills and then the person has the rest of the money in the bank. Um, that might be a starting place for somebody that's learning to manage their money and at some point they say, you know, I don't want that anymore, I don't need that. So representative payee is something that you can set up and then you can change it again in whatever amount of time you want. So that's a really nice opportunity. Um, and then supplemental special needs trust. We've got several videos on our website that explain special needs trust. It's where you can secure funds for a person so that they're protected, um, not just protected from bad decision making, but protected for, uh, that allows you to keep all your government benefits. Um, and then personal safety, you know, having access to personal care attendance of direct support workers might be people that come into place and protective services. You know, um, sometimes we've had people concerned that that people were going to take advantage of them or that there was somebody that was um, threatening to a person and and you can use um, a protective order to keep that person uh, from having access to somebody as opposed to guardianship. One last thing I want to say about this slide is that if you go to the Life Course Tools webpage uh, under Life Domains, you'll find all of the information they have about supported decision making. Um, it will describe what each of these areas mean. There's a, a glossary basically for this form. So if you think, well, what do they mean by power of attorney? It spells that out there in, in pretty simple language. So uh, this is another graphic from uh, the Turning the Life course from UMKC. And you can see in the center of it is the individual. And we always want to make and hope that individual will make as many decisions in the context of their family and their own community. Um, so looking at these different areas. So who in my life could help me with my daily life decisions about employment? And I think the really important thing to remember as a loved one um, and as a parent, I don't have to have one person who's going to maybe take over my child's life. That's always the concern. What's going to happen um, when I'm gone? It doesn't have to be the same person. And many a times, um, and Sharon and I have found this, well, especially when we were doing these um, live uh, workshops, that we had families that said, Boy, I don't have anyone who wants to have full control, who wants my help to my child make all of these decisions. But I do have somebody who's who it wants to and is willing to and makes sense to be my child's spiritual leader. Because it's some it's one of our neighbors and we we go to church together. There is someone in my life who is in the medical field or has an interest in the medical field or has a lot of experience who is willing and wants to help with those kinds of decisions. So just like I sat down um, with my own uh, family and said, here's where we get our taxes done and here's who can help with this and this and this. It's about being intentional and helping your loved one know um, and help them make those decisions about who can help them make these decisions. Sharon and I had one experience where a young man was there with his father. And I should let Sharon tell this story because it's hers. But he said he wanted his um, his uh, workout coach 
to help him make money decisions. And dad was like, wait, I should help you make money decisions. And he explained, well, he's got his own business. He's young. He owns his own house. I think he makes really good decisions. I'm going to ask him for help if I need help in making decisions. They don't necessarily have their, to be their designated person, but helping talk through that about who can help you make those decisions, whether it's formal or informal. I love that story. I was thinking when we were going through this, and I don't know if you want to tell this story or not, but somehow I feel like your story about Andy and the bank going, goes in here. Oh, and I'm so proud of him. So he went from being <laughs> the head, buying parts to a computer to we set up an appointment when he was going to, um, he, he got his driver's license at 28 and um, learned how to drive and he went to buy his first car and so set it up with the bank ahead of time and they kept wanting to talk to me and I was like nope he's an adult he's making these decisions but we need some more support and they got it and they sat down and they explained all of the different components he made really good choices he actually got a really great credit um, or, or rate. It was right before COVID um, and has maintained making on-time payments for this whole time. It was just a really good experience. I didn't have to go in there and explain a lot. I just said, he's not experienced with this at all. This is his first major purchase and we need some educational support. And I'd like for you to be that person. Um, that person has continued to say, if you need something else, come on back and has um, helped with other areas of banking and setting up money markets and all kinds of different um, banking needs. Thank you. I'd much rather tell that story because it's such a great story. And, and one of the things I want to point out is that the the experience that the bank is having there i think it's not just that you feel great as a mom and andy feels great that he's got this relationship banks are want to be community services even if you know there's probably other ways people think about banks the people that are there day to day that are waiting for you to come in they are excited when they have an opportunity to educate and help somebody build their financial wealth that's why they're there people that are um, working in grocery stores um, and in uh, wellness settings want you to come and ask them questions and talk to them about their work. That's their passion. So there are opportunities there that I think we can, can reach out to and pursue. I also think it's important, you know, the very first thing Deborah pointed out was that there may not be one person that can step in and take over for a mom or a dad. And I think that a lot of the times we just sort of hope that's going to be the case. If you are con consciously thinking about each of these life domains and focusing on who's currently there, but also who might be there in the future. You know, if I start having this relationship with the bank today and it builds over time, eventually I'm going to be that person that's been using this bank for 10 or 20 years, I'm the loyal customer, and they're going to be watching out for me. Eventually, you know, I'm thinking about somebody that I know who has a disability who goes to um, the same social activity every week and has built more and more friends. And I think the time is probably right to say, hey, I'd like you to have this more formal role in my, my life, maybe of helping me make sure that that I get things on my social calendar that are important to me, because there's people that that they've made friends with now that are ready to kind of step into that space. And when you when you are the person that is on the receiving end of being asked you are usually very excited about that opportunity. And if you're not, you're not that big deal. You move on to the next person, but most people don't have the experience of being able to be a trusted friend and decision maker for somebody, not decision maker, but um, information sharer. So I want to talk about life experience and risk. You know, um, I was on a jury 
uh, I was called to the jury last week and they asked us in the questioning part, they wanted to know if we believed that a product could be made that was 100% safe. And I went into a spiel about the dignity of risk. So <laughs> choose me for the jury. Yay for me. Um, but there is no way to live your life without any risk. I think that that everybody deserves the right to try some things like that. That person in the video that had the video of him trying rock climbing and he slipped down and didn't do so well the first time and he tried to bake and he burned it. You know, those experiences are learning opportunities and we can be excited when we succeed and when we fail, we, know, we can learn that we have resilience we can dust ourselves off and try again and learn the next time not to turn the heat up so high on the oven or oops to be sure I'm putting in sugar instead of salt so those are things that that we can practice with and you want to balance that balance scale is having choice and risk and balancing it with health and safety so Find your low risk options to start with. Maybe instead of having your family member walk across Lindbergh to get um, a, an iced tea in the afternoon, you'll start with them walking next door by themselves to deliver something to a neighbor. You know, there are ways to, to make uh, good choices about small risks and help people to start building their skill sets. And when people don't have those experiences, when they're overprotected, they no don't think that they can do things. They have lower expectations for themselves. They will start to lean into dependency and expect people to do things for them. And they just don't feel good about themselves. So they don't they don't try. They don't try very hard. And I've had that experience when people thought less of me. I've said, fine, I, I'm not even going to try. So I, I believe that to be true. This is a very poor uh, uh, schedule, uh, visual about assessing risky decisions. But I think it's helpful to at least have some sort of clear thought process in your head that what, balancing the likelihood that something is going to happen if you do it and the impact of the behavior. So I talked about crossing Lindbergh to get an iced tea. That's a pretty challenging street to cross. Drivers are kind of nutty. The likelihood of something happening could be pretty high and the maybe the not very likely, but the likely range and the impact if you're going to get hit by a car that could be major. So that would put you in a high level three area of risk, maybe not where we'd want to start out with something as opposed to um, I want to go next door to the neighbors and, you know, watch a TV, show, watch the Cardinal game at their house. The likelihood of something happening there, pretty unlikely. The impact of anything that went wrong, it's probably pretty minor. The odds are low that it's going to be a se severe impact. Uh, incident if something goes wrong. So think about the decisions that are scary for you. Um, I mentioned earlier the person that had started that joining the social group. One of the first decisions that, that mom took a risk on there was dropping her off in the parking lot and having her walk by herself into the the space, the, the group space. That didn't happen on the first day. Mom made sure that she knew where she was supposed to go, that she knew who she could connect with when she got there, that she kind of had the lay of the land. After maybe two or three visits, mom pulled up to the front and she was not comfortable. It was an uncomfortable decision for her, but she said, okay, go on inside. She sat in the parking lot and she texted to see if she got there okay, but she did not step in there and she gave her the space to try and she walked straight in and did what she needed to do. Now, not only does mom not drop her off, mom doesn't drive her because there's people in the group that have picked up the responsibility of driving and that's an even riskier thing with a not very likely impact of any any problems because these are people that are trusted now. These are people that are friends and natural supports that know her. So we're going to talk about some of the alternatives um, with decision making. So 
much like we talked about in the integrated support star about safety options, we want to look at friends and family advisors and advocacy organizations. There's a lot out there. ARC has quite a few different um, groups that uh, young people can learn how to um, really become their own advocates and families can learn those skills. Those community supports, representative payee, we've got these limited and joint bank accounts. Have a relationship with your bank and going in and setting that up so um, your loved one can learn how to manage their money to, to whatever. Um, I'm like uh, Sharon, if I didn't have auto direct deposit and automatic bill pay, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, I might have some late payments. Um, hopefully we don't have protective orders that we need to keep to keep our loved ones safe, but those are available. And then the supported decision making agreements or personal contracts, which we'll give you in just a few minutes. I feel compelled to just say here, I, I I don't I feel like I have to say it out loud in the friends and family category do not discount other people with disabilities. Um, I can think of several people who have really, really been a great support system and decision making for other people um, and have been great at being able to provide supports people with lived experience about what their own health e experiences have been people with experience about you know what what happened to them on the job or how they managed to learn about money situations so those ad advocacy organizations are not just spaces for people to build their decision making skills but they also can build real friendships with people that are going through similar situations. And for any of you on this call that are family members that have a member with a disability, I hope you've had that experience of being in a space with other family members that share some of those same experiences with you. It's very important to know that you're not alone, to hear from other people about how they made decisions and, and what how it worked. That's a type of supported decision making making that you might engage in that we know through research is really important. So people with disabilities can help each other more than I think we give them credit for. So sorry, I just had to make a little speech there. No, that's good. So these are ones that you might need an attorney. So while the other one families can access on their own, these are ones you may need an attorney to access. There's different kinds of powers of attorney. Um, and there's, I think, nine in the state of Missouri. Uh, and you can find those online and many people will fill them out um, and will have them notarized and do it themselves. And others will use an attorney to draw up these powers of attorney. Um, the, one of the big tips that I um, heard that I've kept with me for years is I don't always have the power of attorney with me, but if I have a power of attorney and I have it on my phone and take a picture of it and put it in my notes, at least I have it that way. And when you're doing them and going to the library or our bank again to get those notarized, to get several copies. Um, and there are several types. There's durable, which means even if I make the decision to make um, Sharon my attorney, in fact, and she's going to make these decisions for me, a durable power attorney, if I become incapacitated, she will still continue to help me um, and make those decisions for me. A living will. Many of us have a living will that says what our end of life wishes are so that when we do become incapacitated, how that would be followed by um, the medical field. We have all kinds of different trusts. We also have the Mo Able um, in the state of Missouri that can help you with money. But that special needs trust, I think Sharon referenced earlier, is a trust where um, money can be set aside and then uh, benefits can be protected. Adult Protective Services, we've mentioned that a couple of times, and then limited guardianship. And these are all things that you can receive help from an attorney on. So this kind of just goes in and explains a lot of people have a power of attorney. You have a power of attorney to help you make health decisions. You have powers of attorney to help you with financial decisions. And so it really is giving someone um, the right to help you and to make those decisions. Powers of attorney can be revoked, and that's where we get questions sometimes from family, that guardianship is more um, set, 
and harder to get rid of. Whereas if I give Sharon my power of attorney and then I decide I don't want her to be my attorney, in fact, and to make those decisions, I can revoke that. Again, these are legal things, um, but it's about the conversations that you have. It's about, I've picked Sharon because I trust her and I continue to have trust in her because we have conversations and she's not taking advantage of me. I kind of mentioned it, there's about nine and some of them have to do with, um, but if you even just Google or go to the Missouri Bar Association, you can find all kinds of information and the forms that you can fill out for these power of attorneys. Um, so the bottom line is there's really no one size fits all. As with everything else with your family member, they are unique and how you put together a plan for support is unique. If you're able to, you know, work with them and just verbally kind of make decisions about what happens, that's fine. Um, here's an example of some language that could be in a power of attorney around uh, decision making. So it says I'm giving them powers to make decisions on my behalf, but they agree, agree to give primary consideration to my wishes in the way they make those decisions. So I think that that's interesting language. Um, we've got sample supported decision making agreements that were created in our state. They're also on the lifecoursetools.com website. Um, the way that the tools are designed, there's one that's um, open-ended and one that's got more specific information on it, but at the very beginning of it, it says the doc the document is or is not legally binding. It would be legally binding unless there's legal guardianships that has been established. So unless your family member has a limited or full guardianship, you can make check the box that this is legally binding. And then this is a tool that would be accepted in the state of Missouri at any point. I love this one too. Um, and if you decide to use the open-ended one, like Sharon said, there's two different ones that you can use. But I think one of the things that families find really helpful about this is we've talked about having conversations and some of the some of the things that don't feel really concrete. The supported decision making agreement and how it walks you through it feels more concrete to families because it asks, I do or do not want someone to make, help me with healthcare decisions. And it goes through and it says like, help me make and keep appointments, help me understand healthcare decisions. So all of those things that we looked at in the one uh, tool um, on all the, all the areas of life of, can I make my own decisions? Do I need support in making decisions? Do, is this a legal area? It kind of walks you through. It not only does that, but it asks you who is going to help you make those decisions. So it goes through health care. It goes through financial, um, community living, where I live and housing. Has education and what kind of decisions you would want in education um, and employment. Again, it asks you who those supporters are. And then it asks them to sign it as well, saying yes. I will help Sharon make buy her next car because I am car and driver. <laughs> um, but it 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 does it helps you feel like you're not missing some things. And this was drawn up by an attorney um, through the supported decision making. Um, Missouri Protection and Advocacy. So I think this is one of those tools and there's many out there. Texas has just a one pager um, that some people really like. In Missouri, when they changed the law and said we need to try supported decision-making, we didn't necessarily have like the Missouri power of attorney, that, that official form. Um, so Missouri Protection and Advocacy and the um, Consortium on Supported Decision-Making said we need to give families something concrete, something that they can go from and use. It's just a tool though. It, 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 it's not necessarily needed. You could draw it up yourself, but it is a, I think it's a really good tool to make you feel more confident that you've covered your bases and covered the really important areas. And even more, um, organized type of supported decision agreement is to have uh, a, 
a corporation to identify your family member as a corporation and have a micro board where that you create a board of directors that are those supported decision makers. That's not commonly used in Missouri, but that is something that happens quite a bit in other states. And I think families are most interested in that when they have a very limited number of family members left um, that can be engaged and they know that there's going to be um, community members and that there might be more possibility of people coming and going. Um, it's an interesting process where you set up sort of a regular routine of meeting quarterly, maybe to discuss what some of the different decisions that might want to be made uh, uh, in that person's life. Um, Micah Fialka Feldman is a self-advocate who started, I don't know that he's got the board, but he has a group of almost 50 people that meet periodically for decision-making uh, where he he talks through what's going on in his life and they're all advisors to him um and uh, he has done a, a many presentations and has written a book with his mom and there's a movie so um lots of cool stuff from the fialka feldman's here's just some more examples of uh ways you can word things um and other, other resources. I do want to point out supporteddecisionmaking.org. That is the national clearinghouse for supported decision making. So there are an abundance of documents there, uh, resources about how to, to find attorneys about how to do some of these other kinds of things. We do maintain an attorney list at the St. Louis Arc. We never directly recommend an attorney, but we have a list of attorneys that work in this area uh, of decision making that we'd be happy to share with you so that you can move forward with that. I just want to, again, thank you for inviting me to be part of this evening. Sharon and I are really passionate about helping people make decisions. We are we are not here to say that guardianship is not the right answer. Every family is different. Every family has different capacities and goals um, for what they are doing with their loved one. But that support and decision making, we've just seen it in action about how um, adults with disability and children, as they go through as they age, um, what it does for self-esteem and uh, how as a mom, it has helped me um, have higher expectations um, because for every two things that maybe we've made a bad decision about, we've got one great or five great decisions that we celebrate on a daily basis. Um, so I just encourage all families to have these meaningful conversations. Some of these conversations are hard. It's like talking about my end of life, what is going to happen when I'm no longer here to support my um, adult child. And, and those, those conversations are hard. So chunk it off. Just start talking about some of the decisions that can be made and about the risk. And then as we make decisions, um, even explain your decisions, make de explain decisions that you're making and fess up and say, oh, I made a really bad decision hiring that contractor. I didn't get three bids and I think I made a mistake. And what I would do in the future would be. So, but thank you for joining us tonight. And hopefully you got something out of uh, this time together. I, I so appreciate having you here with me. And I feel like this has been my conversation this week. I'm just going to um, give a shout out. If this conversation makes you uncomfortable, makes you your stomach a little agitated, um, we talk about this quite a bit through the parent lens in our Joyzen training. Joyzen is a workshop. It's a four four two-hour sessions where we really talk through how hard it is to shift from being your child's caregiver to being their coach and advisor and how to make that shift while taking care of yourself emotionally, but also giving you some tools to build your coaching skills, build your communication skills around these topics that don't feel really easy and comfortable. So um, we're doing the one right now. We'll probably have another Joyzen in the early spring. So if you're interested, please let, uh, let us know and I'll put you on my list to notify you of the next time the session is coming up. And in the meantime, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for spending your time with us tonight. Uh, I hope you'll go back to the YouTube and share this with a friend. 
Good night. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks.